Hi, I'm Paul Cox. I'm an ethnobotanist. Ethnobotany is the study of the relationship of plants and people. And it requires some fairly specialized skills. You have to be half botanist so you understand the plants and how to name them, how to collect them, how to study them. But you also have to have all the skills of an anthropologist and a linguist so you can relate easily and fluently with indigenous people. I've had a lot of fun going around the world. During that time I've seen a lot of beautiful plants. I've had a lot of wonderful experiences living, working with indigenous people. And fortunately, I've actually had a few insights that I think can advance science. Now, a lot of people might wonder how ethnobotany would affect them today. Any time that you walk into a pharmacy and hold a prescription drug in your hand, there's a one in four chance that that medication came from an indigenous healer. 25% of the prescription drugs issued in the United States, Canada, Western Europe, all have their roots in ethnobotany. Ethnobotany also provides crops for us to eat. Ethnobotany provides textiles. But I think the most exciting part of ethnobotany is it teaches us about the essential linkage of people with their environment. Indigenous people are not buffered against their environment. And although they've had environmental tragedies of their own, many of these cultures have learned how to live in harmony with their environment. And so by studying how indigenous people, for example, live on an island environment and maintain it, we can understand as an entire society how to treat our own special areas with more respect and more care. Today, indigenous knowledge is periled as never before. Approximately half of all the languages of indigenous peoples have disappeared in the last hundred years. And of those that remain, 80% are spoken only by small groups of elderly people. So the situation we face today on the cusp of a new millennium is that this tremendous wisdom accumulated by indigenous people over thousands of generations, wisdom that has been trusted in helping indigenous people cure illness, make their lives better, comfort the ill, this wisdom is in peril of vanishing forever. And my job as an ethnobotanist is to record that wisdom for future generations. Much of my recent ethnobotanical work has been what I would call a problem-solution orientation where I'm presented from universities, government institutes, drug companies with problems. One of the examples of that was the National Cancer Institute that was desperately searching for some treatment for the AIDS virus. When I heard this, I started looking very carefully at one of the plants the healers in Samoa were using to treat what appeared to me to be a viral disease. And it was that analysis of that healer compound that resulted in the discovery of prostratin, which is now being developed as a possible combination therapy for the treatment of HIV for AIDS. This great reservoir of indigenous knowledge, which is disappearing so rapidly, I think offers many solutions for some of the pressing problems of the world. And I find it astonishing that instead of looking forward, that we don't look more towards the past towards ancient wisdom that has comforted generations for thousands of years and that I think could help propel us to a very bright future when combined with modern science. The exciting thing about being an ethnobotanist is when you can take some of the plants that the indigenous people use back to the laboratory and test them for efficacy. I'll never forget the day in Uppsala, Sweden when we got the results back of my initial analysis of Samoan medicinal plants, 86% showed pharmacological activity. And we're able to use that activity to create all sorts of new medicines or potentially other products. For example, the healers taught me about a leaf they use that removes heat and inflammation. I initially discovered this by it being used on myself by a healer. And when I discovered that they rubbed this leaf on tired, achy feet, why, there was an idea that I could work with other medicinal chemists, pharmacologists, and come up with a potential product to treat tired, achy feet. They also handed down precious knowledge about their plants from generation to generation. Plants like this, 
which is known throughout Polynesia as awapui. This plant is used by the Polynesian people after they bathe in the waterfall as a shampoo that leaves the hair silky and gentle. Also as a conditioner after to make a beautiful texture in their hair. As you see indigenous people in the village using different plants, you can be trying to match these solutions with possible problems that other people make. And the key point for me has been ensuring that indigenous people share in the benefits of that knowledge. And that's one of the reasons that I really feel as scientists that all of us should be a force for good. That all of us should be involved in helping to assist indigenous people in saving their cultures and saving the environments. And that really has, for me, completed the package, to have science, ethnobotany, and now philanthropy all playing key roles in my life. And it's, it's been extraordinarily rewarding for me.